Welcome to the Staying Free podcast. This podcast seeks to give a voice to real people around the world who are attempting to stay free, stay sovereign and stay sane in a world which is changing faster than ever. In this episode, I'll be talking to Jeremy, who recently left the state of California after he was banned from entering his workplace due to the vaccine mandate. Jeremy is a Bitcoiner and strong advocate for self-sovereignty, and we discuss everything from money to democracy to nomadism and personal freedom. I hope you enjoy this conversation, and if you have any feedback or suggestions for interesting guests, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. A link is in the show notes. On to the episode. Jeremy, thanks so much for coming on. We've had a few interactions on Twitter, but we haven't really had a long conversation. I see that you're coming at me from an RV, so I guess let's fire this up by asking why you're in an RV, how that came about. Yeah, t- tell us about that. Yeah, yeah. Nice to, thanks for having me on too, uh, Johnny. So yeah, like you mentioned, I, I'm currently uh, trying to practice what I preach and try to adopt that sovereign lifestyle right and live in that nomadic life a little bit it's relatively new for me i've been on the road now uh for about three weeks so um i started my journeys in in the bay area california kind of the epicenter of a lot of kind of craziness happening and uh the deciding factor for me to determine that i needed to get out of there was they implemented uh vax passes in my county so once that uh like i had a mental threshold in my mind basically all right when would i actually get out of here and that was it so, so they announced that, and then I basically started uh, preparations to leave. So we left about three weeks ago. We've been on our journeys now. It's taken us, you know, down to uh, Joshua Tree, to the Grand Canyon, Havasu, uh, through New Mexico, and currently in uh, in Texas, in Austin, um, hanging out with some Bitcoiners and trying to do some fun stuff here uh, while um, while we got the freedom. Amazing. And you're traveling with your partner, is that right? Yeah, so I have my girlfriend. Um, yeah, I, I convinced her somehow uh, after a year being together to uh, take this journey with me. We're we're actually both on our way to uh, Florida. Is our final destination. Her family has some property there, so that's where we plan on settling um, for the uh, for the medium to long term. We'll see how it goes. Okay, great. There's so much to get into there. I definitely want to get into the um, the Florida thing, but before we do, like, how long were you living in California before that? I lived in California basically my whole life. So I, uh, you know, went to middle school, high school, you know, went to college about two hours away from home uh, in um, Northern California for four or five years and then returned back to the Bay Area, which is my home. So I've been working out of there for, um, you know, about almost 10 years now after college, um, actually living with my grandma. So I was living with my grandma for 10 years, um, helped me be able to stack and get a little bit more cushion. Um, and it's, it's basically been my whole life. So that was a big change for me, right? It's basically taking that plunge, right, of, of change, right? And it's especially of a, a, something that's so entrenched in you, you've lived somewhere your whole life. But um, it's actually been a lot smoother. You know, there's always these hiccups in, in the RV lifestyle that, uh, you know, they can get kind of gross, you know, dealing with the whole uh, situations um, on the road. But um but it's been relatively smooth. So I'm super glad that I did it. And it, it's been exciting and, and, a, and a fun trip so far. So yeah, you sound like really positive about the way that you're living now, which is great. But I, I'm interested to know before you left California, how much you were kind of walking away from there? Did you have to leave a job? Did you have to leave a house? So I was in a pretty um, nimble position, which was very helpful for me to be able to move quick. So I lived with my grandma, right? So, you know, that was, she was dealing with the, like she had owned the house. So I was, you know, not very rooted, you know, I, of course I miss my family and whatnot, but I wasn't rooted financially or property wise in California. And as far as my job, I got lucky with that as well, that I can take that on the road. It's fully remote. Um, they are actually like, I, they, they just came out with the, they're following the OSHA guidance, even though it's, you know, in the courts right now, they are going through with basically not letting um, unvaccinated people or people who don't get a test in the offices. So I basically can never go back into the office again as of now, um, but I can still work remote. So um, that's my current situation. Okay, that's great. So you're actually working for a company based in California, but you're doing it remotely. They are a basically a countrywide organization at this point. They're, um, they do about probably 400 million in revenue. So a pretty big company. I'm interested to know 
um, in particular kind of your politics or maybe politics is the wrong word, but I would say more widely speaking, kind of your philosophy. Were you always quite anti, you know, these, these mandates and these government diktats? Because as a Bitcoiner myself, personally, I would say that I had a lot more trust or belief in government before I found Bitcoin. And I'm interested to know how long you've kind of had your current philosophy of self-sovereignty. Mm-hmm. Well, they're actually kind of interrelated, maybe a little bit like your journey, right? It's where I had graduated college and I'm like, okay, what's my next step? I want to you know, own some property or buy a house, you know, like some of these you know, simple kind of dreams that you have growing up or whatever. So um, I went along that journey basically thinking, okay, well, let's learn how this works. And I started to learn about um, interest rates and, you know, I mean, interest rates was one of the big things. And then I read a few books on it. And then that started getting me down this path of, oh, then I read The Creature of Jekyll Island. Uh, and then I started realizing, wait a second, how are these inter- interest rates work? How do they affect the price of money? I'm like, holy crap, this whole thing is, it's kind of, it's manipulated, right? It's kind of a scam. And it's all kind of based on these underlying assumptions that no one really thinks about. So that really got me questioning the whole, like the system, at least on the financial side, pretty deep. But I feel like once you um, realize kind of one part of the system can is, you know, not what it's represented to be, then it opens you up to being more open that other other pieces of the pie are, you know, potentially manipulated or not what they seem as well. And that that initial kind of breakthrough helped me kind of, at least in my opinion, see a lot of the uh, issues or the almost downright scams oftentimes and some of the other pieces of the system. Um, so that's, then that obviously led me to Bitcoin as well. Um, kind of looking at for that, for that escape route. Yeah, I definitely think that that's a commonality that I've noticed with Bitcoin as myself is that it was almost as if we were kind of primed for this because we've seen, you know, probably the biggest scam uh, in the whole of human history, which is, uh, you know, fiat money and the money printer and the way that, um, that that is kind of corrupting, you know, all facets of society. And it's almost as if we've kind of been so primed uh, that when this came along, it wasn't a huge kind of leap in belief for us to say, okay, well, they're lying to us about this. Because for most people, they've never seen a lie as big as this. So it's, it's such a huge kind of um, step to take to say, well, how, you know, how could they do this? I mean, you know, the obvious kind of response that you would get from people is, well, you know, how... How could they lie about it? How could they have a lie this big? But, you know, as Bitcoiners, we say, well, hold my beer, right? It's like, it's like, right. it's like, like hold my beer. Let, let's talk about this other thing called fiat money and, and what a, a huge scam that is. And it's pretty clear that you can have lies far bigger than what they're telling about the whole the, the whole COVID situation. Yeah, and that was, I think, a, a Nazi prep, propaganda technique. It was tell a lie so big that people can't even fathom that you could lie about something that extreme, right? And that's what I think, they're using that with everything these days. You know, it seems like with the whole COVID thing, with the money, of course. Um, I mean, you could in a lot of different contexts, I could, I can, you know, you can venture and say that they're doing that as well. Absolutely. And um, so, at the moment, you're on your way to Florida, and that's where you see yourself kind of settling down. Is that right? So yeah. So initially, um, we like obviously. DeSantis, um, you know, who knows, you know, if he's controlled opposition or, you know, not at this point, but it seems like right now they're going down one of the stronger paths in the U.S., right? Florida, Texas, kind of these, you know, at least obviously a red state was kind of number one. Um, I didn't necessarily classify myself as a conservative or Republican kind of before this, more of like a, you know, do what you want, kind of like traditional liberal kind of in that sense. Um, But it's interesting how these kind of ideologies have flip parties in a way. Um, so that was kind of one, one thing. And then, um, my girlfriend had pro- family and property there, which, um, was a big factor as well. Um, but I, if we had talked about where we had actually been thinking about plan B or plan B's or plan C's. And that was part of the journey of, um, going to Mexico earlier this, this summer and starting to pursue some of those plan B's. And that's when we got our temporary residencies for Mexico. Yeah, that's definitely another thing that I, I want to get on is the Mexico thing. But just sticking with Florida briefly for now, because I, I know that for people like me who are, who are from the UK, you know, we're looking at the kind of state system, despite how crazy things are in the blue states like, uh, you know, New York and, and California and some of these other states. And even though it's kind of crazy, and I'm sure for someone like you who's had to kind of change so much of your life, maybe it seems, well, I, I never would have expected to do that. But for us, and I guess most of Europe, really, 
we would just love to have a situation like the state system in America where you've actually been able to kind of, in a way, it's really put the United States to the test. This is what it was designed for. It was designed to have different laws in different states and different systems of operation to kind of compete with each other. And then you see, okay, like who's going to rise to the top? Like which is going to be the best system? And it seems so obvious to me at this stage. And I don't know how anyone can deny this. Nobody's fleeing Florida to go to New York. No one's fleeing Texas to go to California. It's only happening one way. And I'm just not sure how long can that persist for um, without people taking note. I mean, it just seems to me even your biggest kind of like COVID hysteric in these places, they're not going to leave the state and go to a place like New York, are they? Or or is it happening in the reverse? Um, I mean, I would... would like, obviously, that's the more popular direction. But I do know people that are actually like, um, like even some folks in the Bitcoin space, they're like, oh, yeah, I'm excited to move to L.A. And I was just thinking, oh, my, you're moving to L.A.? Like, holy cow. Right. Um, so it is happening. I think it's obviously people that maybe they're under the assumption that like, OK, this COVID thing will just blow over. Right. And not maybe it's seeing the big picture of how these things interweave and, um, you know, kind of the long term trajectory that things are going on the slow ratchet in especially in the blue spots so uh but i mean the people that are conservative or more conservative or kind of just orange pilled or uh, maybe more traditional liberals it certainly seems as it's going you know to like texas the floridas the tennessees the wyomings um uh, certainly the most popular but on your point of of the states right it, i'm so thankful right that we have that federalism because i keep you know, even if Biden is trying to do these these diktats by mandate, you know, there's it's um it, it's good to see that the states are actually a lot of the states are fighting for a lot of people's rights. So I think it was 27 states were challenging like this OSHA mandate that was requiring each employer with over 100 people to uh, either require a vaccine or and or a testing policy. So. It gives me some hope. It's not necessarily what I'm banking on long term, just because this, the trajectory is just there's so much inertia behind kind of the the stripping of freedoms. But at least it slows it down and I'm going to write it out as long as possible. And where would I like to write it out? I'd like to write about with the most freedom as I can, you know, while we have it. Yeah, absolutely. And also you've got um, a kind of second residence in Mexico now. I'm interested to know, first of all, why you did that when you have the options of places like Florida and, and Texas and some of these other red states, and also how you went about that and what your thinking was really around that whole Mexican residency. Yeah, so there was a few aspects to kind of thinking about that. One, like I wanted to get a backup for the U.S. just in case there was issues with the U.S. as a whole, right? And we're seeing some of those issues that potentially could play out. For instance, um, like, you know, one easy one would be if there was a war, right, and all of a sudden, crap, um, you know, some places are going to be safer than others, but maybe you don't want to be in the U.S. Or if the restrictions get really bad, just being stuck in one spot, even if it's in one country with the federalism, there still could be issues there. Two would be related to taxes and the money situation here. Um, they're, I mean, they're going to go the MMT route, it seems like, and they're trying to implement laws that um, aren't necessarily crypto friendly, right? Or maybe even crypto, you know, adversarial. So um, if that got bad enough, right, I would certainly start to think about, okay, well, what are my options? So um, a place like Mexico was really interesting to me, one, because it was super easy as an American to get the temporary residency card. Um, The process took like, you know, $1,000 and we had lawyers um, to help us out too. You could actually do it yourself if you wanted for a lot cheaper. And, um, you know, the process only took a couple months. Right. It took basically a trip to the consulate in the U.S. and then um, the immigration office in the, in Mexico. Mexico City is where we did it. So the, the burden to do it was pretty low. And what you get is you get a temporary residency and the ability to renew every year. And if you renew four years in a row, you can apply for a permanent residency. So it's kind of starting this baking period of potentially having a plan C um, in another country, if things get bad enough in the U.S., I had also looked at other places like um, Panama, for instance. They had a program where you could uh, basically buy your residency for like 25k investment, but that program was just expiring when I was kind of looking, so I missed that boat. And now it's like 250k. Of course, the El Salvador um, program. It, I mean, on its face, it's interesting, but when you, I think it's three Bitcoin. Um, and that just keeps getting more and more expensive in fiat terms. Um, 
and I don't like partying with my Bitcoin. So yeah, I really think that El Salvador is is missing a trick here because what we're essentially talking about here is geopolitical game theory. I mean, you've got countries like Mexico, which in my opinion is one of the most rational countries when it comes to their immigration policy. Like one mm-hmm. of the only rational countries in the whole world. As you know, I've been living in Mexico uh, for the past six months as a tourist. I, I've been trying to get the residency myself, but I'm having problems because there's so much demand at the moment to get to the uh, embassy mm-hmm. here in the, in the UK. We've only got one you can go to. And <laughs> I don't know why that is. I don't necessarily want to say everyone's trying to flee, but I'm sure that it's having, <laughs> I'm sure that it's, it's, it's having some impact, uh, things, things being so crazy over here. But it seems to me that We still have a system of capitalism in the world right now uh, that is operational. And as you've got clown world getting more and more crazy, it seems to me that there is a kind of arbitrage opportunity for these nation states to really say, hey, we can turn things around here because you've got a lot of people who have a lot of wealth. And, uh, you know, I'm sure we'll get onto the onto the kind of Bitcoin aspect of that at some point. But let's just say a lot of wealth, generally speaking, you've got millionaires who you know, are saying, no, I don't want to take a vaccine. Oh, I've got to leave my state, you know, et cetera, whatever, whatever the reason is. And it seems like Mexico is one of the only places which is kind of taking advantage of that. And I'm surprised there's not more countries out there that are saying, hey, you know what, it's all well and good saying we're going to lock down forever, but we can literally completely enrich our nation and then we can have all the healthcare we want. You know, I mean, that would Mm -hmm. be, in my opinion, just a great talking point if a country like El Salvador came out and said, hey, you know what, we're not going to lock down, we're going to take people in, we're not going to require vaccines or vaccine passports, but you bring your money here and we're going to revolutionize our healthcare system because all of these people are going to come in with all of this money. Mm -hmm. That's going to have far more benefit than having lockdowns and vaccine passports and you know, essentially staying staying poor and, and not not inviting a lot of these these wealth holders who are ready to cross borders. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, I, yeah, the the thing with that, I guess, is that when we think about it's interesting because Mexico seems pretty reasonable. Like the president came out saying, you know, kind of questioning some of Big Pharma's policies and whatnot a, a few months back, which you know was really reassuring, um, you know, to an extent. But like, I also think that some of these nation states they might just be a proxy for powers that lie behind them, right? I think I've looked at a few of the c- contracts with uh, the nation states and like, some of these big pharma companies. And they're basically using some of their, their you know, air bases um, and some of their critical infrastructure as collateral for these vaccines. So, and as what's the famous, the famous saying is that the um, creditor is the slave to the debtor, right? At this point, you know, they're, it seems to me that they're, uh, somewhat in the, the pocket of these big um, supranational powers, including big pharma, including maybe countries like, or maybe uh, organizations like the UN, the WHO, uh, et cetera, that might be influencing the sovereignty of these countries. So that's why I think we're seeing a lot of these vaccine passports and a lot of these lockdowns in countries that it doesn't make sense for them to do. Like, let's say like Costa Rica seems to came out with, you know, some some level of this or countries in South America. It's like, why would they actually do this? They have such a big opportunity. And I think it's those big macro geopolitical influences behind the scenes that are um, pushing them that direction. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you've heard about the situation in Belarus where, believe him or not, he claimed that the IMF had offered him a ton of money to lock down and he said, Mm -hmm. no, I'm not locking down and rejected it. I don't know how much to believe that because how much can you believe how much can you believe anything coming from politicians, yeah. democratically elected or otherwise? But um, it's just another kind of economic factor, which we probably don't see. And it's going on behind the scenes, but we just don't have the access to it to kind of be able to weigh that up as as a factor in this whole game theory. Yep. Yep. And exactly. And that's why it makes it so difficult. It's like you, we really don't see what's going on. Right. So it's like, all right, what's the best that we can do? The best that we can do is, you know, play with the information that we have. And that's why some pla- a place like Mexico um, is really, it's, it's attractive at this point because they have some of the lower amount of restrictions and lockdowns. And there's this element, maybe maybe this is true, maybe this is not, you can let me know. But there's this element of thinking, okay, in the US, like we have a very, a very big government, um, you know, and if they really want to come after you, they can basically put you behind bar, bars legal or illegally, right? Um, but in Mexico, or maybe in other countries, right, that maybe don't have as strict as a rule of law or perceived rule of law, there's this idea that, okay, well, if you get pulled over in Mexico and you are dealing with the right cop, you can say, all right, um, you just maybe pay him off or something like that. Um, 
and that that's it that's actually appealing right it goes down to like core power structures right it's like all right if i can just simply give this guy enough incentives to let me off for just maybe with some cash then maybe you won't throw me in mexican jail and if you can do that you know you you, you can almost buy your freedom a little bit better here in the u.s that if you make the wrong um adversaries here in the u.s you're gonna get thrown in jail no matter what right um or or that cost is higher to bribe essentially yeah, I totally agree. I actually think that when the world gets to a certain level of crazy and when the authoritarian powers become so strong, um, you actually want there to be a kind of black market economy. And the stronger the black market economy is, that acts as a kind of counter to the entrenched powers. And um, it is crazily one of the things which I think is uh, attractive right now. You know, like when I'm looking at places I, I, I want to live, I don't want to live anywhere that the government has too much power, <laughs> essentially. Yep. So let's get on um, a little bit to Bitcoin because my followers are not, um, I would say they're prim like primarily not Bitcoiners, uh, a few are, but this is definitely something that I think plays a key role in all this. And it was one of the reasons why I wanted to bring you on specifically is to talk about Bitcoin. So tell me, broadly speaking, why you think Bitcoin is important and in particular um, in the current times that we're, that we're going through. Like why is Bitcoin a useful tool right now? Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a couple of layers to it, maybe macro and micro. At the macro level, I think about where a lot of our issues stem from. A lot of the issues stem from the, the government's ability to basically print money and do whatever they want, whether that be war or implement these vaccine passports or shut down the economy and hand out basically UBI or, or funds to keep people happy. Um, those are all enabled by the money printer, right? So if we can starve their ability to do that, right? If, if, if we were on a Bitcoin standard, that cost to do those items is bit, it's infeasible, right? So from a macro perspective, I think, you know, that's, that's why I love Bitcoin, right? It can hopefully start to slowly starve off these, um, these powers from implementing all these crazy policies that they otherwise couldn't. And I, I gen genuinely think they're evil or malignant powers oftentimes too, because if you basically have the money printer, you have, the incentive is for the craziest, um, most psychopathic people to want to get that place of power because it almost gives them unlimited power to do whatever they want, right? So it's starving off that um, that central point of failure um, and those incentives that are, are bad. Um, personally, or on the micro perspective, it's obviously ability to uh, save and escape inflation. And what's really nice is you can hold it yourself. So I, I have a, you know, a pretty traditional job, a fiat job, you might call it. Um, and, you know, most of the, for a while I was putting, you know, saving money, you know, in the bank or in my 401k. But as I read more about, you know, what happens in times when governments go at, you know, too high of debt levels or they get desperate, you know, what, what do they come after? They come after things that they can get their hands on. And 401ks are, you know, sitting ducks, um, money in the bank is sitting ducks, you know, so, okay, well, what is something that I can truly own and hold that, you know, that's Bitcoin and the private keys. They're going to have to come and, you know, infiltrate my mind somehow um, to, to get that from me. So uh, it, it, it brings back sovereignty to, to myself financially, which is, which is very nice. I'm glad that you brought that up. I actually made a tweet yesterday, um, which my, to, I think a lot of people who aren't Bitcoiners may have just thought I've completely lost my mind. And the tweet said something to the effect of, they're going to come for your money if you're unvaccinated. Your money isn't safe. It's not safe in the bank. It's not safe in any of these other um, investment vehicles. And, mm -hmm. you know, when I say that, I mean, we've just seen, uh, I'm not sure if you've heard, but like, for instance, in um, Austria, I think they've now officially got a lockdown of the unvaccinated. So <laughs> yeah. it's getting to a very, very scary stage now where um, the way that the unvaccinated have been kind of scapegoated by the kind of entrenched powers as the enemy of the state. And the only times we've ever seen this in history, they have stripped the assets of those people. Like it's never not happened. They've never gone as far as we've, we've gone even further than now, if we're locking down the unvaccinated, than what uh, has been done previously in history. I mean, we've actually had times in history where the assets have been stripped before they've told, blocked everyone in their homes. So given that we're at this stage, it seems plausible to me um, that the vilification of the kind of unvaccinated is now at a point where governments probably, you know, if they can lock you down in a place like Austria, a supposed kind of Western democracy, and they can lock people in their homes for deciding, you know, that they want to live in alignment with their own bodily autonomy and not take a uh, injection, 
If that can happen, I don't see any breaks on the power structures not to strip people of their assets directly. Because if these people are just, you know, such enemies of the state that we just lock them up, you might as well take all their assets and pay off some of the some of the debt that all these governments are in at the same time. Now, I know that that, that seems outrageous now, but, you know, everything that's happening now seemed outrageous a year ago and everything that happened a year ago seemed outrageous a year before that. So I, I definitely think mm-hmm. that what you're talking about here in terms of the ability to hold that asset and as Bitcoiners, you know, we've used this asset and when you use it, it completely changes you. You realize you've got something and no one can take from you. It is completely unlike anything else. And, and there really is a kind of awe that comes with that. And I, I would like more people to experience that because the government's already stealing from you. They've already got things like negative interest rates in some places. They're already taking money out of your banks, essentially, by stealth. They're already printing money and devaluing the money that you hold. So they're already stealing from you in all of these myriad of ways. It's only an extra step now for them to say, hey, we don't like you, whether that's you who is the um, you know, whatever group it is at the time. Right now, it seems like the unvaccinated are the enemy of the state of the age. For them to say, "Hey, we're going to just take your take your assets now." But if you have Bitcoin, they cannot. They, there's literally nothing they can do. There's there's nothing they can do at all until unless they're gonna they're gonna break encryption, which is used for basically like everything in the whole world. Unless they can break that encryption, then you've still got your wealth and you've still got everything intact. There's nothing they can do. Yeah, I mean, it's what the quote is. I think it's all tyrannies um, operate through fraud and force, but once the fraud is exposed, they just rule through force, right? So basically, they hide the, the tyranny as long as they can under this guise of fraud. You know, they'll make up every excuse in the book, whether COVID, climate change, terrorism, whatever they want, basically to give them an excuse to to steal. Through inflation is the most popular thing, it seems, or the most obvious to us. But they're probably, you know, they're using it with all this pork and all the bills, or you know, that they, they, they use it in so many different ways, right? So um, once and the fraud to me is becoming more and more obvious and more and more exposed. So once the fraud is gone, all that's left is the force. And they, that's that's a direct confiscation, you know. I, it's, it doesn't seem that crazy to me. Absolutely. And and the other thing that you mentioned before, as pertaining more on a macro scale, is that people think we live in a democracy, but when the government has access to the money printer, that completely undermines every aspect of democracy in, in a society. Because if a government can just print money, they don't need to ask your permission to do anything. I mean, if we were on a Bitcoin standard now and we were paying taxes from our um, from our Bitcoin, which is you know our, our wealth that we're keeping privately, ho- holding it, and the government can't take it from us or print it into existence, then this would be over before it even started because the government would not be able to come to the people and say, hey, we're going to shut down all of your businesses now and... Um, you know, uh, we're going to just police the streets and we're going to lock down the unvaccinated and we're going to have police go around and make sure that teachers aren't going to school who aren't vaccinated in the case of, I think, Australia or, or maybe New Zealand. Or we're not going to have uh, people working in care homes who are unvaccinated. We're going to send police there. Like People would just say, sorry, I'm not paying taxes. I'm going on a tax strike. Like You sort, you know, you sort, sort that out, like sort out all of that um, craziness and then I'll start uh, paying my taxes. Whereas right now, there is no democracy because whatever the government want to do, they can fund anything. They can just dream up anything they want and they can fund it. Like in the UK, we've got this quite infamous test and trace app, which uh, I think I think it was something like 70 billion. Or so. I, I can't remember the actual amount that they've spent on this thing. It's absolutely unbelievable amounts of money. It's not as if they're going to people and saying, oh, uh, we'd like to uh, tax you, please. Can you sign on the dotted line here? We'd like to spend it all on this test and trace thing. No, they just print it. They just, and when they, by, by print it, we essentially mean kind of borrow it with the guarantee of a bailout when that all comes crashing down. So, you know, this is why Bitcoin is so central to this, because we can do all we like democratically, you know, we can try to get leaders elected or whatever. And I think this is the paradigm that a lot of people, particularly in the UK, are stuck in is, oh, well, you know, the next general election will elect out anyone who's voted for these things. It's like, well, one, that never happens because we've got this two party system, which is, you know, how democracy tends to end up anyway, uh, like the, the lesser of two evils. Um, but two, even if you get your person in power who you want, like there's no guarantee that they're going to do what you want because they could just be another shill uh, for this for this kind of this globalist craziness. And there's nothing yeah. you can do because they've got access to the money printer now. Exactly. And then like I, th- I almost think democracy is a guise at this point. Right. It's like, all right, all these key things, these huge things that are impacting our day to day life. Like we didn't vote on any of this stuff. Like we didn't vote on these test and trace apps. We didn't vote on vax passes. We didn't vote on these you know, lockdowns, 
like these are things that impact our day-to-day direct life. And we had no say in these things. It was basically mandates or emergency powers, right? And then once you hand over power in an emergency, it's very hard to like, regain that freedom, right? Or restrict or, or crawl back those powers. So that's what we're seeing right now. I know in California where I'm from, Gavin just extended his powers five more months and he's probably going to extend it even longer and longer. You know, we'll see how long the charade goes on. But it's just, it, it's kind of a facade in my mind at this point. And it comes down, uh, I wrote a, read a book of, by uh, F.A. Hayek, uh, Road to Serfdom, right? And he talks about, you know, all democracies, they slowly, they slowly morph into basically a socialist kind of hellhole in a sense. And then the next stage after that is the tyranny. So I'm not exactly sure where we're falling in this line of between democracy, socialist country and tyranny, but it seems like we're certainly farther away from the democracy than the other two, the tyranny and the socialism. Yeah. And I'm not sure where this is kind of all going to end up because to me, one of the things that actually has been quite a good takeaway or probably a net positive is that I hope that this finally removes this false illusion of democracy being somehow this really great system. You know, I mean, I felt like before the year 2021, the idea that you would say democracy is a farce, you know, people think you're some kind of fascist. or you're like, what, you you know, you think democracy is this or that. Whereas I think now it's like democracy got us here. Democracy got us here. And uh, the problem with democracy is that all it allows for is for a majority of people to tyrannize the minority. Mm -hmm. Democracy will absolutely allow a majority of people to strip the assets of the minority. And that's why it ends up ultimately leading towards communism, because there's always going to be a majority of people who are less wealthy and a minority of people who are more wealthy. That doesn't mean that those people, and I'm going on a bit of a tangent here, which is kind of a separate point, but doesn't mean that those people have made their money illicitly. Um, but those people in the minority say, oh, hey, we, we need this uh, government institution to go and take their, their assets and, and redistribute them. And that doesn't make it right. You know, it doesn't because someone has more money than you, it doesn't remove that first principle of saying, well, it's wrong to take people's stuff that's not yours. And I, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I tweeted about this. There's, there's a guy, an MP in the UK. Um, I can't actually remember his name right now, but he is always tweeting this absolute just just I mean, it's like straight out of. Karl Marx, you know, he's basically just saying, ah, there's this, there's, you know, these people have got this much wealth, we could take this wealth and do this with it. And I'm like, sorry, like, when did it just be okay to just say these people have got, if I went out onto the street and said, oh, that guy's got a really great computer or whatever, like a a guy, a guy sitting in a coffee shop, and I said, hey, this guy's got a great computer, Um, we could take that computer and sell it and give cash to homeless people. Like, that doesn't, that's not suddenly okay. But all of a sudden, when the politicians talk about it and say, well, if you're rich, then, you know, we're, we're ready to just, you know, you must be some kind of um, parasite, which is actually, you know, complete projection. Um, they suddenly think it's okay to kind of redistribute this wealth. And essentially kind of democracy leads naturally into this. And uh, if you wouldn't mind, like, talking about this, because I think that Bitcoin offers an alternative system. The way I see it is that uh, this is actually an alternative form of organizing ourselves as as humanity. It's kind of like, it's not anarchy but it's not democracy. It's kind of like a a rule set that you can opt into, which actually is kind of based on a set of first principles. Yeah, it's interesting because I've, as basically like what I've seen the world as eroding, you look for points of truth, right? Or things that won't change or things that are stable. And I like, I've, for me personally, it's like led to two things that I wasn't necessarily even into that much call it three years ago, right? It's like, all right, what are these what are these true rocks that I can rely on? And for me, it's been two things, basically like Jesus and Bitcoin. Essentially, it's like, what are these, what are these truths that I can rely on? So um, certainly it's, it's been quite, quite the rabbit hole, right? That it's, I, I actually grew up, you know, when going to Catholic school and whatnot and kind of fell out of it for, you know, a decade, but learning about Bitcoin basically and looking for that truth, that underlying first principles that led me back to kind of basically Jesus and all the wisdom, like in the Proverbs, the Psalms, the parables, all these things like, oh my gosh, wow, there is so much truth there. And that's, it's such the antithesis of what we see in this world on the media or whatever. That's just like, it's just chaos and just everything seems upside down. So, um, you know, of course, Jesus and then, and then the Bitcoin side of the house, it's, 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 it's reliable, right? It's kind of the most reliable, one of the most reliable things in the world that I can see. So when times get hard, basically when things break down, you want to look for those reliable rocks. And with uh, basically proof of work with the distributed hash power, when we talk about 
you know, what's securing Bitcoin. I don't see anything else that's more secure than that. And especially, you know, financially, that's such a big, um, you know, a, a key, it's, I almost call money like freedom units, right? It just gives you the ability to do what you want. So to base, preserve my freedom, um, I'm going to store it in the most, the, the strongest, most secure thing that's available to me. And that's, and that's Bitcoin. Um, what, what's interesting though, too, though, is that it kind of bring, I, I think a lot of people go through this evolution of like rediscovering these first principles when they discover Bitcoin and whatnot. And it's, it's crazy because you see the community doing this. It's, there's so many um, examples of people kind of returning to this. It's like a, a good example for me is like untapped growth, what he's doing with the um, regenerative farming, right? It's like you have this low time preference that you kind of rekindle your thought process with Bitcoin. And now you start thinking about the land and it kind of pervades everything that you think about. I've started to think about like my dynasty and my kids and how I'm going to preserve my wealth for them, you know, and, and my wife or, you know, my future wife, um, She's in the room right here. She just, <laughs> um, I, yeah. Anyway, um, but uh, but like you start thinking so much longer term, which is, uh, I mean, that's how I think it should be, right? In this fiat mindset where you have to be on this hamster wheel of earning money because you're it's perpetually getting stolen from you. It's just a complete change of thinking, um, and it's it's been a great evolution for me, and I, I think it's overall a, a positive, certainly a positive for humanity. Yeah, I feel exactly the same way about that. It does, you know, Bitcoin like definitely changes you. And this is one of the reasons why, although this isn't a, a Bitcoin podcast, and I don't want it to be, uh, you know, I do really hope that people take stock of just how important this actually is, because, you know, not only is it such a useful tool, but I want the people who are building the future to be building it on this Bitcoin standard. You know, I want the people who are against this stuff, who are fighting for freedom and all the rest of it. I want them to be Bitcoiners because the way that I see it, because my belief is so strong in Bitcoin, is that the future is going to be shaped by the Bitcoiners. I truly believe that. And mm -hmm. um, before these kind of big um, financial institutions and before everyone starts piling in because they just completely see what is plainly obvious, I would like to get more freedom fighters in there in the meantime. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw the stuff that had happened with Chris Sky and, you know, he had this big kind of falling out with the Bitcoiners and stuff. And I'm just like, mm -hmm. oh man, I, I want this guy to be a Bitcoiner. Like, you know, it sucks that he's um, kind of, got this this attitude and he kind of thinks it's above it and he's so you know self-involved mm -hmm. with his own personality but it's like i'd love for him to be a bitcoiner because you know that that just brings a, a real you know a real freedom fighter i do think that he is that you know um mm -hmm. into the space and it would be great to see yeah yeah well, like we're on the same team right it's like come on we don't need this infighting this is a tool that you can certainly use chris so hopefully he, he figures it out um there's there's kind of one other point i wanted to make on this subject right it's it's the future is going to be digital right it seems like digital money is the future and we basically have a choice, right? We have, you can choose Bitcoin or you get to choose these central bank digital currencies. You get to choose a CBDC. And that's the complete antithesis of Bitcoin, right? It's centrally controlled, surveilled, tracked. They can take it away from you as soon as they want. They can restrict what your purchases are. And they're already talking about this in, you know, under the guise of, oh, we're having more monetary tools, right? And all these central banks are you know, exploring these, these ideas, but what it's just, just another control mechanism, right? Or we have the alternative, which is, you know, Bitcoin and other, like I'm Monero is interesting to me as well, just because of the privacy features. And I think that's one of the, um, vectors or the, uh, you know, a potential vector for Bitcoin, but I mean, Bitcoin, um, is like, is, is an opt out for that. And that, and that's so key. Because when you start combining these ideas with the Vax Pass, with the digital ID, with the CBDC, it's like, holy crap, every aspect of your life is controlled. Like, feel like it feels like the mark of the beast, right? You know, it's, it's, it's crazy, right? It, 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 I, I can't help but think that. But we have some options, right? We can fight against this. And one of the key tools is, is Bitcoin. Yeah, absolutely. And the way that I see this playing out is it's almost like the battle between um, capitalism and communism is going to go digital and uh, the communism is going to be the central bank digital currency and everything's controlled and they decide what you can spend and where you can spend and how much you can spend and whether you can you know spend this on gas or you've had too much gas this week and you know sorry we mm -hmm. don't want using this small business you got to use an uber because we decided because you know some government you know official has made a made a, a backhand deal so you know we get to make the rules and you have no say in it and then on the other hand you've got bitcoin which is going to be actual freedom money um, which is offering an alternative to all this. And um, I think you're basically going to have these two systems like side by side. And in my view, Bitcoin is obviously going to win just as, um, you know, decentralization and capitalism and these kind of natural economic forces are always going to win out against um, 
it, it's it's opposite. This is clear. So you know, my mm-hmm. long term view is very optimistic. I'm pretty pessimistic in the short term. I think things are going to get a lot worse before they get better. But um, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that central bank digital currencies, once all money goes digital and it's as easy as for someone to you know spend their Bitcoin and, and accept Bitcoin, etc., as it is to spend and accept their um, central bank digital currency, I think the natural choice will be Bitcoin because that's going to be the one where you can spend it anywhere with anyone. Um, and the central bank digital currency is going to be completely uh, controlled and co-opted. Yeah, certainly, certainly. And and then you think of the game theory, then they know, okay, we're going to have to squash Bitcoin basically, right? So they're going to, I, I expect they're going to do some craziness to try to coerce or enforce against Bitcoin, right? But it's just part of the, it's part of the battle um, that I think we all kind of knew that was coming. I, to me, it came faster than I was expecting, but it, it was just something that we all kind of knew was coming. So, um, you know, it, it's quite an interesting and it's actually an exciting time to be alive. We're like living through this whole revolution um, and you don't get through, through the other side without kind of the pressure or the or the hardship. Right. It's it's kind of coal under pressure makes diamonds, you know, so I'm, I'm waiting for the diamonds at the end of this. Yeah, I totally agree with that. You know, I know there's a lot of Bitcoiners who think that the government is just, you know, that the, the game theory is such that the governments will just end up piling in and they'll be like, oh, hey, don't worry about it. Like we're in, on a Bitcoin standard now and you can just, you know, we're going in because of geopolitical game theory. We need to get in before China. I personally don't see that because what I see right now is I see basically China being the model for every single government, pretty, especially uh-huh. Western government around the world. Um, it seems to me like they're all in the same boat. There is no, ge- you know, governments are not at war with other governments right now, or, or m- maybe they are in very small scales. Maybe, you know, there's if, possibly with Iran or something like that. There's, but, you know, is, is America really at war with China? It doesn't seem like it. It seems like the Biden mm. administration is pretty much following China's playbook. So I don't see them playing a, a geopolitical game theory with, with Bitcoin. I see the war being against the Bitcoiners themselves. Which obviously is going to be a losing war because you know Bitcoin is essentially a language. It's decentralized. There's node running all over the world. But will they try and come after the Bitcoiners? I definitely believe so, and we've got to be like prepared for that eventuality. Yeah, certainly. I think like the nation state right now, the idea of it is almost just like a smoke and mirrors behind like the real power structures behind the scenes. I think you know, uh, like you said, China and like and Joe Biden and other powers, they're in lockstep, right? It's literally like Operation Lockstep. What was it, the Rockefeller playbook? You know, everyone's literally in lockstep. So someone's coordinating, they're talking behind the scenes. These, you know, nations or these borders that they put up, you know, to me, it just seems like smoke and mirrors. Um, At this point, it's, you know, we have the 1% or the 0.1% or the kind of the traditional power structures in government, basically trying to extract as much wealth from the populace as as they can at this point is, it's kind of how I perceive things. And and that's probably the least sinister thing that they're that that ex- explanation, in my opinion. You know, maybe uh, there's probably more probably more control or long term control that y- you can um, think about and get into. But uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, to- I totally agree that there's kind of various degrees of, of red pilling. And like, yeah. you know, the, the, fir- the first level is like, oh, it's just the government trying to extract, you know, wealth and resources and pillage their population. And that's like level one. <laughs> and then you, right, know, you yeah. can go you can go to the extreme end of this and go into the whole population control, this, that, and the other. And, you know, I'm still not sure which which red pill I've arrived at yet. I, I guess I'm probably, <laughs> I guess I'm probably somewhere in the middle. But um, yeah, for, for sure, that is like, the, you know, the, the least uh, worst thing that could be going on right now is that it's just governments trying to extract wealth and, and pillage the people, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, All right. I want to just end um, on kind of one final question because I want to end on something a bit more like optimistic is like, um, how do you how do you see things kind of uh, improving? What are the things that people can can do immediately? And what world do you want to see in, you know, five years time compared to where we are right now? Yeah, I mean, I just I I think the macro trend right now is, you know, governments are getting more tyrannical, but the people are it's becoming more obvious and the people are waking up, right? Which is, you know, which is awesome, right? So like, after we get through this period of strife, people are going to have this experience to draw upon, like, oh, we're never going to let that happen again. Hope, you know, or at least after at least a couple of generations, right? We'll, we'll, you know, stave off tyranny, hopefully, and then, um, you know, have that embedded in our memories. So as we kind of figure this out and the more of the more population figures this out, we're going to start fighting against that with all the tools that we have available. You know, Bitcoin, I think localism, is going to be a more piece of that. I think we're going to be a more religious society. I think a lot of times people have basically replaced their morality 
with legality, right, of what's legal or what the government says is okay. Um, but I think we're going to return, oh, wait a second, we're going to realize legality doesn't necessarily mean what's right or what's moral, right? And I think we're going to return to more um, moral structures, what, what, call religion, call it whatever you, what else you want. I think we're going to return more to that. Um, localism, I think the impacts will be great. Like it's, it's, um, you, you're going to you're actually going to talk to your neighbors. I, I remember like walking around in San Francisco, like everyone's just on their phone and no one's even talking to each other, right? It's, it's, it's not almost inhuman, right? So I think we're going to return to some of those um, more, you know, human values as we rely on each other to get through hard times um, and, and start to build more relationships. It's also, I know for like me and you, right? We've connected so through some of these topics which is awesome. Like we're starting to branch out and find like-minded people. Like I, I think these are all certainly positive things uh, in the short term, like who knows how like interesting things might get, but I think uh, the macro trend is, is altogether good, right? I think we're going to see more homeschooling, more localism, more Bitcoin, more waking up, return to morality. And um, you know, the, the macro landscape is going to be what it's going to be. But I think on an individual level, I think um, more and more people are going to start adopting some of these principles that I think are overall good and better for humanity totally just to kind of like piggyback off that point there like like you said we would never be having this this conversation um if all of this stuff hadn't gone so crazy i mean i definitely feel like we're creating a community here and it's happening in real time i do think that right now it's a counterculture but it's growing and growing and the more that we are connected the more that we're able to kind of organize. And I think that the despondency towards government and the, you know, people are just accepting, people are kind of opting out, maybe not um, physically, but certainly um, spiritually, they're opting out of these systems and people are building their own communities. And, uh, you know, it's great to kind of be having conversations like this and for other people to kind of, uh, you know, to hopefully kind of cross pollinate different communities as well and get people like talking to each other so that we can actually start building a new system because, you know, I can't remember, I'm going to butcher the quote, but it's something like, don't focus on destroying the old, but focus on building the new. And I definitely think that that's, we've entered that stage really quick. I mean, we're only like, um, we're only what, like less than two years into this madness and um, people already are focusing on building the new, or at least from what I can tell, most people are, are trying to do that and they've accepted that the old system is not working. <laughs> um, yep. could, be, could be projecting because that's, a, you know, obviously like very, very strong in the Bitcoin community. But I think even outside of that, people accept that they need to, try and develop some self-sovereignty, you know, make the communities for themselves and, you know, work for themselves and, and, and all this other stuff that's certainly going to like help us in the future. So I just want to say uh, thanks for coming on. Let people know where they can find you as well. Like um, where, where can people get hold of you? Yeah, yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Jeremy Bleez, J-E-R-E-M-Y-B-L-E-E-Z. Um, that's that's my name. My real name is Jeremy, but uh, I'll stay uh Keep the other parts private for now until I see you guys all at the Citadels. Uh, I'm looking forward to, you know, building a community and participating in the community that you, uh, Johnny, that are help building. Uh, it's always awesome learning or um, getting in touch with more like-minded people. And I, I'm, ex I'm excited for us to uh, start building and continue building this new future. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. I appreciate that. And good luck in Florida. And thanks again for coming on. Yeah, cheers. Thanks, Johnny.